The word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit of the joints and the marrow, and is a critic of thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show yourselves approved unto God, a workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. All right, open your Bibles to Romans 8, verse 35. Notes you should have picked up Sunday. Didn't get to them, but we'll do it tonight. <coughs> I've been giving people a few extra minutes to get here. Uh, don't take advantage of me. I try, to, I try to give five minutes if I have to. Uh, because I understand different situations. And in my old age, I've gone soft. <laughs> Startup time is 7.15. Uh, so I, I know that people from time to time have issues. There's a lot of things that happen. And I understand that part. I've always told people, even if you're running late, make it. Get here. It's the principle. Even if you're 10 minutes late, uh, you know, come in, quietly slip in on the back row, uh, and away we go. All right. In life, attitude matters. If you're going to be successful, you have to have the right attitude. And we are to have this correct attitude as we approach your responsibility this evening, as in every Bible class, is to hear this information out, understand, according to your frame of reference, what the principle is. Actually, in this section, I don't find it that difficult. It's pretty basic information. But it is, I, I do not take for granted that there may not be people that are fully on top of this principle. Uh, so, and again, for all of us, repetition. Repetition is important. But even if we've arrived, we get a, another level of appreciation of some doctrine and some aspect of God's plan. So let's be sure we're in fellowship and ready to go. Let us pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we know that there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. We are not of that crowd. We thank you that you continue to provide for us this oasis where we can come apart from our daily concerns and exposure to the cosmos and take in the mind of Christ and acclimate to that which will ultimately prevail over all. Be with us in our study in Christ's name. Amen. In these verses, there's nothing that can come against us. <coughs> nothing that can come against us, that can separate us from, from the plan of God. The plan that has been on the table forever. And your name as a believer was there. He foreknew you forever. God knew you, that you would appear in time and come to the salvation adjustment. He knew that. So he predestined, he predestined all that he foreknew. He, for, he predestined them to be actual mere images in every respect of Jesus Christ. We are not going to have a lesser form, a lesser body. Just as we partake of the earthly through the process God set in place, with people having children and they being facsimiles of their parents and on down the road. So in this new order, we're going to be exact mirror images of Jesus Christ. His body I'm talking about. Obviously he's also deity, but he is glorified humanity. So. The predestination was for us to be conformed to that image, and every believer will be. Then, the outworking of the process involves three steps. 
and they all occur in time. In time, we receive the call to salvation, calling. God gets the gospel in front of us. Pretty remarkable to have a plan that is completely airtight. Only God could do this. He calls all he foreknew. He gets the gospel in front of them before they can die and perish. Because before salvation, one of the ways of describing the pre-salvation state and all those that are in a state of unbelief is that they're perishing. You can use an analogy in the human realm. If we don't get a rescue team in there, those people are going to die. So they pull together a rescue team and go in there and extract them from some situation that will, without that, would claim their lives. So they were perishing. People alive and active in the world today without Christ, and without hope, they're perishing. Before you and I were saved, we were perishing. But we got the gospel in time and canceled that situation. By perishing, I don't mean just dying physically. I mean dying and going to hell on the road to, so to speak. So the outwork of this plan in time is the individual gets the gospel. God knows who they all are. And when the time is right, they'll get a gospel hearing. I got mine when I was a junior in high school. That's when I got mine, my call. And I, and I responded to it in a positive way. I believed in Jesus Christ and I was justified. So calling and justification. I didn't understand that then. No way like I do now. I don't believe I'd ever had it taught to me that you need the plus R factor to qualify you to have a relationship with God who is plus R. God will not have fellowship with that that is less than himself. And I'm not talking in terms of his omnipotence or omnipresence or uh, omniscience. I'm talking equal in the righteousness factor. And of course, to live with God and enjoy the eternal state we have to have his life. So we're imputed, we're imputed with plus R, doctrine of justification by faith. It is reckoned or it is reckoned to our account. He stamps us with plus R. And on your best day and worst day, you've got plus R. You're justified. Now, obviously, there's more people out ahead of us that are going to have to make this adjustment, uh, get called, and get jumped. But when, it, when it's the church age contingent is all on board, when the last member of the body of Christ believes in Jesus Christ, and that'll probably be on the day of the rapture, wouldn't that be funny for that person who doesn't know very much, probably, and they get saved, and the next thing they know, they got a resurrection body. That's the fifth verb, justified. Uh, uh, not justified, glorified. That's the fifth verb. That's the goal of the predestination factor. Now, that brings down to the question that I believe that a lot of you are completely on top of, but always bears repeating. There is nothing in this big bad world that can separate you, as he says here in his question, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Who, an erogative pronoun, will separate future active indicative at some future point out there, future active indicative, korizo, which means to separate in the Greek, from the love, definite article, agape, the love of Christ. Or put another way, 
Christ's love for his own. He loves his own. Now, his own may be a reversionistic, messed up believer, but there is a level at which he loves that believer. And is, if you love something, you protect it. You do all within your power, if you love something, to protect it. Some people even lay down their lives to protect somebody. Will tribulation, here we have a series of seven nouns. Will tribulation, this isn't referring to its technical use of the great tribulation, the seven year period, because the church isn't going through the tribulation. This is simply a word, its, its foundation and meaning is pressure. It could be translated trouble. So either way on the tribulation, uh, will trouble of any kind and sort in a general sense. Or distress. Now these words obviously don't specify one thing. Well, some do, excuse me. The second one, stenochorea, can be translated distress, calamity, difficulty. Or persecution. Now that diogmas, <clears throat> that's people who are down on your case, whatever they're doing to make life miserable before you, <clears throat> excuse me, because you are a believer and a positive believer. I read a report today, I forgot the numbers, but around the world, all over the earth, there are millions and millions of Christians in certain countries and places that are being persecuted, driven from their homes, denied jobs, and worse. One country, Nigeria, in Africa. Christians are under attack. And as this angelic conflict cranks up, we're, we have been here in America. I mean, individuals are persecuted by family and they get on your case and this and that, and your parents hate that you're positive or whatever it is. I suffered some of that. It was what it was. They finally gave it up and behaved themselves when they realized what I was committing my life to. Once that didn't work, talk, I didn't get kicked out of the house or anything. <laughs> but I was, I was, you know, I made it clear to my parents that I was going in the ministry, going to be a minister. Oh, you have a better mind than that. What? You, 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 you know, and, and the worst stuff is you're, you're going to be reduced to having little old ladies in your church bring you vegetables. No, I, I actually, what I heard. <laughs> well, what's so bad about that? You want to you want to put some vegetables out there for me and some of your uh, I, I'm not I'm not humiliated by that, but it was like that's what I was going to have to survive on. And then the worst one was you're going to end up in an asylum, writing scripture on a wall. That was another one. I haven't got there yet. All right, I was going to lose my mind. So I went through that little phase, but I, but I soldiered on, got a new set of friends, Christians, believers, we had somewhat of the same language, same enthusiasms. We still had fun. I dropped the Cosmos crowd, the unbelievers of high school. I dropped all those guys. I was still stupid. I still tried to drag women to church. I thought they'd be positive. I didn't call it that back then because I was in the church. You can get anybody saved. No, you cannot. Did Jesus fail with Judas? 
See, you have to think this stuff through. So I, I suffered some persecution and I've, and I've suffered persecution here in this pulpit by my own members who went sour. They shouldn't have treated me like that, but okay. So persecution comes in various forms to Christians, diagmas, that one we can sink our teeth into. Tribulation and distress are general terms that can overlap. Doesn't specify one test over another. And this one is, or famine, limas. Now famine doesn't necessarily have to mean the Great Depression and there's no food and everybody's, you know, scrounging for food. It can mean simply hunger due to a lack of food. And I'm not talking about, I gotta go eat, I'm hungry. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a restriction on foodstuffs to the individual. So it's translated famine or hunger or nakedness. Now that doesn't necessarily require someone has no clothing on. It has to do with inadequate clothing as well. Inadequate <coughs> garments and coverings. Probably any number of you have never had that experience. I haven't either. I've had lesser and better clothes, but I've never had. And food, well, things could get thin at, at certain points in uh, uh, our married life, but there was always food there. Not somehow I turned up. But he's trying to illustrate that these kind of things, even in their worst case scenarios, cannot upset your relationship to God and, and your status as a believer in Jesus Christ. Or peril. Peril is some kind of, you are, you're in peril. You're, you're, you're in a dangerous situation. Can do not, can do, can do not. And then the last one, sword. Makaria. That was the Roman sword. Uh, the Macaria, the Macaira was the Roman so sword, uh, distinguished by the fact that it was of a certain length, not too long, like some big long broadsword. But it's like that one, it's behind my desk in my office. That's a replica. That's an exact replica that individuals in the church got me that was made in Italy, ironically. And it uh, is characterized by its uh, handle, and the fact that it had both sides were sharp. Unlike a lot of knives, one side sharp, the other isn't. This one, both sides are sharp, so if the soldier in combat, whether he's, whatever movements he's making, he's, he's, he's deadly. Makari, Makari. So in that regard, it could be anything from believers caught up in a war zone, a country in war, or simply crime. The hatred against, there should be an us in here, the hatred against us is continuous. Something to know. The cosmos isn't your friend. A people will befriend you. That sounds contradictory, doesn't it? God will use unbelievers to befriend and help you. But the cosmos at large is positioned against God's children. Just as, it is, just as it is written, a quotation. And of course, this comes from the Old Testament because any scriptures quoted in the New Testament come from the Old Testament because the New Testament wasn't formed up yet. For your sake, for the sake of the Lord, for your sake, <clears throat> this is a preposition you don't see very much. An eka, for the sake of you, we are being put to death. Present passive indicative thanatao. In the passive, it in the in the active it means to die. In the passive, it means to put to death. 
We are being put to death all day long. We, and he uses an analogy from the quotation, we were considered, there's your Logizomai again, to consider as sheep, probaton, the noun, the sheep for or to be slaughtered. It's not an infinitive, it's simply the noun genitive, the sheep of slaughter would be the literal translation. Anyway, sphage, slaughter. But in all these things, in all these things, we overwhelmingly, we overwhelmingly conquer. We overwhelmingly conquer is a verb. It only occurs here. The verb to conquer, nikao, we have, a, we, have a, we have some sportswear that's based around this verb. Nike. There's the verb. There's the verb. Nakao. But we have huper nakao, above and beyond conquerors. We overwhelmingly conquer. It's like through him, and we come back to this, uh, you could translate that overwhelmingly. We we are oh, we are overwhelmingly victorious, dia through him, Christ, who loved us. Aristactic participle. Come back to the love factor there in the deal. <clears throat> so, noting your place in the plan of God. In verse thirty-five, Paul entertains the notion that there are potential dangers facing believers in a listing of seven items. And in any one of these, it's happened to some believer or more through time. They have gone through some hardships, difficulties, and all those things specified in these words. Serious ones. Now we live in the United States, of course, and because of that, and in Oklahoma, which has got a lot of fundamentalists out there, Christians, we have an experienced state-sponsored persecution. The government after us. We haven't experienced that. Not anything out in the open, as in other places and other times. Christians in history, I guess we've got the number in here. I'll try to keep up with it. Once in a while that happens. It's one of those quirky things. 0. 0.17, I don't think so. Uh, he prefaces the listing with a question for our consideration. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? This then is followed up by a listing of threats that believers might undergo. The love of Christ here, quote unquote, refers to his love for those that are his. Jesus himself said, while on earth, regarding believers, I had a number of things to say about them, that no one can snatch those that are his sheep out of his hand, away from his power. Using the shepherd analogy. You know what the good shepherd does, don't you? He's out there alone with his sheep, taking them out for the day to graze and drink water, but always being on the alert for the wolf, the predatory animal. That's why he carried certain weapons, like King David, but as a youth, he carried a sling. And he had, a, he had a club. And he was deadly with that sling, as Goliath found out. As a young lad, he was deadly with it. I saw a presentation of uh, in some country, I think it was Spain, 
And they have contests with that and they whirl these things around and they hit things with that rock, that certain specific rock, certain size, and hit things like you were shooting with a gun, dead on, bam. And in warfare, they use slings. That was one weapon of ancient warfare. Sling, those that, that, that uh, hit the enemy with these projectiles. Romans, uh, John 10, 28. You are the object of his words there. I'll read where the sentence starts. This is a this was a confrontation he had uh, that took place in Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus is walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. The Jews then gathered around him, so not a gang up on him, not doing anything physical. And we're saying to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. They don't really want to know this. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. He stands up to them. The works that I do in my Father's name, these testify of me. They point to who and what I am. But you do not believe because you're not of my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. At the most basic level, a believer responds to the gospel. And I know them, and they follow me. There was a, a peculiarity with sheep. Maybe, maybe, maybe you have it with your pet. It won't respond to anybody but you. It's, 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 it's a nature of, of them, Sh sheep that are taken out there. They know the voice of their human master. They listen to his voice. They won't listen to other voices. Even if they mean them no harm. And I give, e and I give eternal life to them and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. How about that little speech for these Jews that wanted to gang up on him and pressure him? I told you who I was. And you're not my sheep. They're, in their words, they're not believers. They're goats. They're goats. Yet another statement regarding the topic of eternal security. The listing in verse 35b refers to a variety of threats that believers might experience. The first is tribulation, a general term here for trouble or hard circumstances. And any number of us have been, gone through some difficult circumstances of different kinds. Pressures, things come down on us, <clears throat> And we and we, we we bore up under them, hopefully. But in any case, they had no impact at all whatsoever on your relationship as a believer with the Lord. Did not none at all. Not a ripple. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, 1633 these things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace in the cosmos you have tribulation Jesus didn't promise his disciples everything's going to be smooth for you every day of your life you're in a hostile environment if you will you're in a war zone not a war with weapons and things of that nature. You are in a war zone. And it, it varies from time to time. 
In the world, you have tribulation, but take courage. I've overcome the world. And the implication is, so will you. We are going to be, and that's our verb, super victorious over the cosmos. Uh, we know that tribulations work for a positive good. Nothing is happening to you as a positive believer. But I have to tell myself that. I got to acclimate. I got to get oriented to certain things and situations. I can get all out of fellowship and get all wrapped up. I got to snap out of it because then you're not in your right mind. You know? God takes all these bad things. and You can't, you can't get through this world without bad things. You can walk away from Maranatha Church, not even go near a church like it, or even go to church at all. Just go out there and have fun in the cosmos and get your whatever and do this and do that. You're going to have tribulation. You're going to have problems. The rich don't escape it. They can't insulate themselves against injuries, crime, and all other kinds of stuff. They die just like the rest of us. They can't keep their souls alive. The general term, uh, we know that tribulations work for a positive good, Romans 5, 3. The general term distress refers to a variety of things, even extreme things like calamity. And one believer that experienced more than his fair share, if you will, was the Apostle Paul. He lists in certain places in the New Testament some of the stuff he went through. He suffered in some imprisonments, beatings, various kinds of situations in his travels. The Jews were always after him to make life miserable for him. Paul had a test like, I don't suspect, I, well, I don't know what God could, would, might do to somebody. But Paul went through a period of his life where he, had a, where he came under periodic attack by a demon. And I mean physically inflicted excruciating pain in his body. And, and, oh, and, but, but there was a reason for it. Do you know the reason? Because the Apostle Paul, on one occasion, was stoned to death. He got to go to heaven and spend, I don't know how many days, how long. He was stoned while he was in Galatia. They put him up against the wall and threw rocks at him until he was dead. His soul went to heaven. He got to be in the third heaven. Then subsequently, God cleaned up his body, put it back in order, stuck his soul back in him, put him back on his feet, and told him that he couldn't tell anybody any of the details of what he saw up there. Put, on, put him under a gag order. You're not building your ministry on this. So, that is verse 7. Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason to keep me from exalting myself. This was to keep him, remember we just studied? He had an STA and pride could have kicked in. Who do you know that went to heaven, proper, above, came back and continued their, their life? I don't know anybody. No believer. To keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself, to keep his STA under wraps. Whoa! Because it would have wrecked him spiritually. So periodically, he didn't even know it. This demon hit him. And it was painful, as you know what. For the period of time that it lasts, and then it went away. 
And he never knew when it was going to hit him, apparently. Considering this, I implored the Lord three times that he might leave me. It'd be the natural thing to do, wouldn't it? And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For power is perfected in weakness. Digest that phrase. For power is perfected in weakness. Spiritual power. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses. Can you imagine that? People boast about their strengths. I'll boast about my weaknesses. So that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Because it's complete trust in God, and he goes able to go through these things. Because God told him in the beginning of his ministry, I'm going to show you the kind of things you're going to suffer. <coughs> Persecution refers to attacks against us for our faith, ranging from minor affronts to extreme actions. It's one of the reasons in the parable of the sower that some believers fall by the wayside. They give up. They can't, they're not, they're not going to take any more abuse from family. They want peace. They want family. And, they're tired. And, and so persecutions kills their plant, so to speak, in the parable of the sower. You will be persecuted for your faith. Get your armor on, get in fellowship, and work. It's, like, it's like a fight. Get yourself through it. You'll get through it. So persecutions are mentioned throughout the New Testament. Uh, that The Matthew one, uh, Acts 13. So I have to tell myself, things I go through, yeah, God could take all that away from me and uh, I not have that problem or this problem or that health test. Uh, but the Jews incited the devout women of prominence and the leading men of the city that's Gentiles, Jews stirring up these Gentiles. <clears throat> Excuse me. And instigated, and instigated a persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. Okay. So what did they do? They figured it was in the will of God for them to be driven out of there. Not that these people were supposed to do that, but that they shook off the dust of their feet in protest against them. They got outside the city. They did a little protest. They wore sandals. Their feet are dusty. They shook the dust off against them. They went to Iconium. You don't want the truth? You don't want the gospel? You acting like this? We're finished with you. And the disciples were continually filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. We did the 2 Corinthians and other verses that deal with the persecutions. After Paul left, the Thessalonians came under attack from the, 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 the city and the people in the city of Thessalonica. Okay. Famine or extreme deprivation of food can undermine our so great salvation. So again, uh, Paul experienced, he experienced a wide extreme of things. It wasn't all just, it wasn't all just suffering and everything. He experienced a wide variety of things. He even, he, he, he even experienced an abundance on occasion, having everything he needed. And then the other extreme, the wild swings. <clears throat> uh, 
He gives a listing here. How about this one? Uh, I'm going to read in conclusion this evening, if you're with me. 2 Corinthians 11. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Five times. Three times I was beaten with rods. That's the Roman. Once I was stoned. I told you about that one, didn't I? <laughs> Three times I was shipwrecked. Oh, that's fun. A night and a day I have spent in the deep, holding on to a piece of wood from the ship. A whole 24 hours out in the Mediterranean Sea, holding on to a piece of wood. I have been on frequent journeys and dangers from rivers, because they had to ford rivers. Dangers from robbers, highway robbery. Dangers from my countrymen, the Jews. Dangers from the Gentiles. Dangers in the city. Dangers in the wilderness. Dangers in the, on the sea. Dangers from false believers. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights. In hunger and thirst. Often without food, in cold and exposure. Apart from such extreme things, there is the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches, the churches he founded and established. They're in his heart and his mind, and he cares about those believers that are out there. He wants to know how they're doing. Who is weak without my being weak? In other words, I empathize with believers that are suffering. Who is led into sin without my intense concern? All right, see you tomorrow night. Hopefully we'll be here and the weather won't be too extreme. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity. May God, the Holy Spirit, encourage us in Christ's name. Amen.